Hey everybody, Tactic Angel back on the PlayStation 5 to take a look at another premium ship in World of Warships Legends. This time we'll be looking at the Carl XIV Johan, a Tier 8 premium Swedish or pan-European battleship. For this review, I'll start with some history, then we'll move into analysis, run down the stats, and finish off with some gameplay. If you want to skip around though, you should see some time codes in the description to help you out. Well, for those of you with some knowledge of naval history or a skeptical eye for squirrely English language, you're probably already wondering why there is even a history section in this video. And you would be right if we look at the in-game description, could have is doing a lot of work in this sentence. Notionally, what is happening here is that this is a ship built by the Inner War Weimar Republic for the Kingdom of Sweden to satisfy the very real desire of the Swedish Navy to add at least one battle cruiser to their fleet. Where the wheels fall off of this counterfactual are that I'm not sure how they want to read Germany is forbidden to construct or acquire any warships other than those that are to replace its limited allowable navy is anything other than a prohibition of building warships. Would have been a lot easier to say that the Treaty of Versailles could have allowed the German Reich to sell its several battle cruisers then under construction. The German delegation could have been more successful negotiating, and Allied powers seemed mostly concerned with making sure that Germany didn't have a first, or frankly even second-rate navy. Not specifically that they needed to have all of those ships scrapped. And at the time the Versailles Treaty was signed, Germany had been constructing several battleships and battle cruisers. Realistically, buying a heavily discounted or free ship would have gotten around some of the budgetary concerns Sweden had that we'll come to in just a minute. None of these were sold off, they were all scrapped as required by the treaty. And we can see elsewhere that the delegations were certainly open to the concept of transfer though. Of the remaining high seas fleet, many of those ships were transferred as war prizes. Britain told the Germans where they could drop them off, though they probably should have been more specific about the depth but Sweden didn't have the money to build something like this. To put it frankly, the cost of this ship would have been several times more than the 27 to 35 million krona the Swedes were willing to pay for a coastal defense ship. For comparison, Graf Spee would have been about 72 million and Scharnhorst about 126, plus or minus, depending on the exact year when you want to price it out. A lot of these costs are also being sunk into things that would have been a bit overkill for what the Swedes wanted. When talking about a battlecruiser, they were talking about a ship capable of 24 knots, very much the British World War I definition of a battlecruiser. But that would still compare very favorably to the speeds of other coastal defense ships, which were more in the 16 to 21 knot range. And Van der Tan, presumably a precursor to this design, had a nautical range of about 4,400 miles at cruising speed which is coincidentally about the distance by sea from Stockholm to New York. So you can imagine that might have been a bit overkill when you're not planning on sending the Navy's one and only battlecruiser and the entire Swedish Navy on a whirlwind tour of all the foreign holdings Sweden didn't have. While having 12-inch guns might seem interesting, and I guess they could have made these 30.5 centimeter, 58 caliber C-39 guns, but when I say could have, I mean the Germans, because this isn't a Swedish gun. This gun never entered production, and only one prototype was ever built in the 1940s, so I'm not sure why the Treaty of Versailles would matter at that point. More likely, if the Swedes had purchased the ship from Germany, they could have equipped it with a domestically produced weapon created by the Bofors Company, like the 28.3 centimeter 45 caliber model 1912 used on the Sferia class of Panzerskip or coastal defense ships. Drawings from the time survive with these effective and well-liked guns, but also other calibers were contemplated for battle cruisers, including a 25.4 centimeter gun and even ships as lightly armed as having six 21 centimeter guns, which probably would have been similar artillery to what you find on Oscar II, just more of them. But however you think of it, 12, 12 inch guns seemed to be a bit more than they were asking for. But so what? If they could get a deal on a ship, wouldn't it be better to have an even more capable ship? Maybe not. Sweden's whole defense strategy centered around being more trouble than they're worth. The Swedish Navy wasn't intending to sail very far into the Baltic Sea, much less the Atlantic, to fight some grand naval battle. No, they would skirmish in the Baltic before sailing back into this mess of islands and invite their attackers to do something about it. 
These ships may look kind of, well, let's just say unimpressive, but the Sferia class coastal defense ships had 11.1 inch guns, more than twice the armor of a Hipper class cruiser, and an even slightly more shallow draft. They definitely were long in the tooth by World War II, but I certainly hope you have some S-tier nautical charts and a crackerjack navigator if you want to try to dig these ships out, because running aground isn't nearly the sort of mild inconvenience it is in-game. And I guess also you might have to try to do this while trying not to hit mines that you can't see and while being shelved by shore fortifications. Don't take that as an endorsement that one or the other would win. The whole point of this is to dissuade a country from even trying. In any case, lots of things could have happened. Sweden could have named a ship after Karl XIV Johan, though the chances that you name a ship after a Swedish king go up considerably if the king is still alive when the ship is commissioned, like Oscar II and the actual ship of the line named Karl XIV Johan. The name the Swedes were considering this whole time was the Tre Krona, and I suspect the reason we don't see that name on this ship is because eventually they built one with that name. As far as the namesake of Karl XIV Johan, it is named for Jean-Baptiste Jules Bernadotte, the son of a common lawyer born in Pau in southern France. Had his father not died when he was a teenager, he probably would have become a lawyer, but instead he joined the French army. Since he was not a noble, he was limited in how far he could advance while serving the French monarchy. Coincidentally, he threw in with Napoleon Bonaparte, married Desiree Clary, the sister of Napoleon's brother's wife, making him essentially family, and he was eventually appointed as one of Napoleon's marshals. Meanwhile, off in Sweden, Karl XIII was without an heir. He'd appointed a gentleman named Karl August as his heir, but he had a heart attack and fell off his horse, and one way or the other ended up dead. Looking for a new heir, delegates from Sweden came to France to try to find a suitable replacement. Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte was admittedly not the first person that either Napoleon or the Swedes would have appointed, but among those who visited to appoint the new king was Karl Otto Morna, cousin of Gustav Morna, who surrendered to Bernadotte at the Battle of Lutbeg, and so fair was Bernadotte in his treatment of Count Gustav and his men that he'd gained something of a reputation in Sweden. Appointed Prince of Sweden and then eventually King, Bernadotte took the name Karl XIV Johann. Upon leaving French service, he told Napoleon his loyalty would be to Sweden from that point on, which is kind of interesting because he joined up with the Russians to repel Napoleon from Eastern Europe in exchange for restoring Swedish rule over Norway, which would last for about 100 years. As for the family of Karl XIV Johan, his descendants sit on the Swedish throne to this day. Maybe that's not really all that much the history of Karl XIV Johan, so much as me waffling about on Swedish history, so I hope everyone learned something. And if it seemed like all that was a bit excessive, it might have something to do with Karl XIV Johan not being much to talk about in the actual game. Karl is the first Tier 8 pan-European battleship and only the second pan-European battleship in the entire game, period. For most intents and purposes, though, it's a German battlecruiser with a couple of differences and quite a few less options. One of the key advantages Karl enjoys is that, unlike those German battlecruisers, she has a 32mm bow. That's not actually mind-blowing. Most battleships at the Tier do, but Karl also pairs this with an icebreaker. German battlecruisers tend to have a weak nose. The ship also is a good fire starter with both decent potential out of her main battery, at least for a battleship, but also her secondaries. Unfortunately, the torpedoes are not as usable in Legends as they were on PC, so some of your damage over time potential has been lost in this translation, but I guess having torpedoes is considered a strength all by itself. There are longer range than German torpedoes, they do a lot less damage, and unlike a couple of other battleships at the tier, you can't fire them from stealth. I also like the flag, but I put that on the list mostly because I'm struggling to say anything nice about this ship. Unfortunately, Carl has a couple of problems. The largest of them are basically that this ship is poorly protected. The game lists armored as a trait. The only way this makes any sense is if you consider that the three millimeters of increased icebreaker armor is totally making up for having the second lowest turret armor value, second lowest belt armor value, and the joint thinnest deck armor value among battleships at tier eight. Plainly speaking, this ship is not well armored. 
She then pairs her fairly low armor values with low HP and the worst torpedo protection of any battleship at the tier. This is made somewhat worse by the ship having a relatively high visibility on Legends, leading her to take a lot more shots at ranges where her limited armor doesn't really matter. She also suffers from lackluster speed and really no commander that is well suited to either playing her strengths, which have been largely removed, or shoring up her weaknesses. Janko Vukovic baits you into being less able to dodge torpedoes or having even lower range than you normally have. And that's for the hopes of secondary range and survivability. It's probably honestly the better choice, but you could also go with Conrad Hilfrich, who at least plays down your high visibility and can make the boat go faster at the expense of doing almost anything else that is useful. As far as who's going to like the ship, I suppose anyone who's really, really into German battlecruisers but who might prefer just being able to sit bow in and letting the armor do a lot of the work. And so long as you're engaging only one target at a time, and preferably at relatively short ranges, that can definitely work. Now, as we go into stats, I will be comparing this ship to all the other ships at tier eight. But since this is a German ship hiding in the pan-European line, you might hear a few more references to that. First, survivability, Carl doesn't have a lot of hit points, at just 72,900, and it is paired with the worst in class torpedo protection at just 20%. When we look at the armor profile, we discover something that it took me a few battles to figure out. Carl is very well protected from short ranges, enjoying a 32 millimeter bow with a 35 millimeter icebreaker. That extra three millimeters is gonna help you bounce anything shot directly at your waterline when you bow in. Your belt is 330, and that's backed up by a 50 millimeter turtle back. So like German battleships, she tends to take a lot of penetrations, but when broadside and at close range, she's a lot less likely to take citadels than other ships. Karl exhibits a lot of other German traits in terms of her artillery. For one, your main battery consists of a dozen 12 inch guns that the Germans were developing, but never really produced and they can shoot at a below average 17.1 kilometer range. The 25 second reload is quick and the 30 seconds on the traverse is quite good. Your HE shell damage is lowest at the tier by just 50 points, but 8400 on the AP puts you a more distant 3100 behind any other tier eight battleship. Thanks to the reload, that means that you're about 10% above average per minute with high explosive with the caveat, these don't get German penetration. And since you're the fourth best fire starter at the tier, maybe you just want to sit on that and play up the cruiser part of this battle cruiser because Carl lags a bit behind on the DPM race when shooting AP. Plus the small caliber of gun means you're not penning most ships that aren't positioned with any sort of significant angle. Also, if you're going to be running around ruining people's day with damage over time, you have a reasonably effective secondary battery. DPM is about 20% above average with a very healthy 6.5 kilometer range. Two items of note though, your secondaries also don't have German penetration, meaning they're actually mostly here to just start fires or damage destroyers, lightly armored cruisers and superstructures. And the good news is that among secondary fire starting potential, Carl is at least best at the tier at this. Carl also starts with 16 torpedoes, four quad launchers, two on each side. They reload relatively quickly and have a very high speed. Depending on your perspective, they either have impressive range for a German battleship, unimpressive range for a non-German battleship, or you should just be happy that you have torpedoes in the first place. But what is unquestionable is that they don't do a lot of damage. These are pretty typical pan-European torpedoes, the kind that are generally used to whittle away your enemy from the comfort of not being spotted. On this battleship though, you're really unlikely to fire these from stealth, but it's still nice to have the damage. If you knew that the Bofors company was founded in Sweden, then it shouldn't be a surprise that this supposed Swedish battlecruiser would have good AA. She keeps company with Maine, Republic, and Alsace as among the best AA at the tier, your long range is 5.2, which is good, and the long range damage isn't bad either. Add to that another 400 plus damage at around 3.5 kilometers, and if you're a carrier, you're going to pay to strike Carl. You still may want to do that though, because unfortunately everything about her armor scheme and torpedo reduction kind of makes her a big target that's easy to damage. 
Carl's maneuverability is nothing special. In every way, each one of these stats is just a bit better than average. You're 0.4 knots faster than average, you have a 10 meter tighter turning circle than average, and enjoy a half second advantage on your rudder shift. So she doesn't feel super terrible to drive, at least the actual activity of driving the boat, but between her survivability and concealment, something does feel just a bit off. And while we're talking about concealment, we'll just look into that too. In absolute terms and legends, the concealment isn't bad. She's 300 meters more concealed by sea and air, and 12 kilometers is the best detectability for a battleship while firing from smoke. But she does have the strange distinction of having been hit harder in her conversion from PC to Legends in this area. To try to summarize it quickly, Carl is just about the most ridiculously concealed battleship on PC. And while she is reasonably stealthy in Legends, she's not even the most stealthy battleship at this tier, which means that she tends to take a lot more fire than she does on other platforms, and it more or less pairs poorly with all the other characteristics we've talked about. As we look at consumables, Carl comes with a totally normal damage control party, which does differentiate it from German battlecruisers a bit. Her repair party is a totally typical half percent per second for 28 seconds. You get three of these, same as most ships. Similar to German ships, you do get a sonar, though I guess they have slightly better hearing in Deutschland because the range for detecting both ships and torpedoes is less than German battleships at this tier, which are usually sitting between 5.6 and 6 kilometers. It's still a nice thing to have. Finally, we finish off with the secondary targeting consumable. You should immediately notice that you have four of these. That's one more than average, and it's slightly better than your typical secondary consumable. This recharge is a minute faster, but has the same characteristics as your average battleship, which seats the K-14J comfortably between your average battleship and the Dyson that we just talked about, with its even more effective, faster reloading consumable. That should round it off here, but notably you have no planes, so your consumables are what you get, as is your air defense and accuracy. Okay, so... Sleeping Giant. Carl the 14th, Johan. Here we go! I want to say off the bat that I'm initially not impressed with my starting position. This particular position does not allow me a lot of opportunity to uh, shoot from any sort of retreatable cover. And also, going around the outside seems to me to be a bit of a waste of time if you're not a particularly fast ship. Uh, also, since we spawn with one less person over here because of the aircraft carrier, you know, so happy to see him in the game. It doesn't seem like a great plan to go there. I will go ahead and put my commander up on the screen. It is Janko Vukovic. His ability in slot one is hopefully going to allow me to start some more fires by increasing my rate of fire. And then maybe we'll tag onto that with some secondaries. That seems to be about what you're supposed to do with this ship. If you're supposed to do anything at all. Uh, but everything else here is just to try to increase my survivability, more or less. While you're looking at that, you can already see we're being attacked by an aircraft carrier. So, as it turns out, maybe a good thing that I'm on this side? I don't know. I don't really ever feel blessed to be in a battle against an aircraft carrier. And for one reason or another, he is uh, already sort of honing in on me. You can see, though, that he is paying for it a bit. Saipan doesn't start with a whole heck of a lot of aircraft, so losing six right off the bat. It does demonstrate the power of the Carl with the AA. We do end up taking a hit there. Thankfully no flooding, though we do have our damage control ready if we needed it. Now you see, earlier I had been on HE. I'm switching to AP here because if we can keep the Plymouth spotted, I would love to shoot at that. It is a lightly armored target, and if it's broadside to me, which it is 
more or less, that would offer me some opportunity to get some, you know, pretty decent hits. He goes dark. Um, I'm not going to be able to do much about spotting him because we lose our destroyer in the middle. And of course we do have the aircraft carrier coming back for more. He gets a whole bunch of pretty decent pens there. The 32mm deck and even less superstructure is not going to resist any of this this sort of bomb damage. It's it's even worse actually if you end up against something like a August von Possevel because it will just straight up citadel you for days. That said, he's lost 11 planes now. We're doing okay uh, based on our persistently detected status. We're gonna go ahead and hit sonar just to make sure we don't get torpedoed by anything and it's a nice trick to have now you can see I am putting shells out on the Giuseppe Verdi those are HE shells And as we back up, we're trying to get a little bit closer to the island because with the carrier coming back for us again, we want to make sure that we we limit the amount of room he has to actually successfully drop torpedoes. And we do. And he loses another six planes. So if we haven't already suggested that this is a decently defended ship from air, there it is. It's a decently well-protected ship from air. I will stand by my observation that any damage he lands on me is absolutely going to stick because I don't have very good defenses. But we put some shells out on Plymouth. If I wanted to play a little bit more accuracy, I could probably land better shots than that, but you are going to have to kind of wait for ships to give up their broadsides, particularly cruisers, in order to make the most out of those shells. Otherwise, against battleships, I mean, you can citadel them. I've had reasonably good success in citadeling things that are relatively poorly armored. Things like a Vladivostok. Uh, I've done it several times against a Yamato or a Musashi, but they really do have to give up their sides and you do usually have to be at kind of closer range than this. You can see we're picking on this Giuseppe Verdi with the HG shells. We're doing that in part because we don't want to actually have to go into close combat with him. He's a better secondary ship. You see, we turned out there. His SAP secondaries were probably going to shred this ship pretty badly. We get underway so that we don't just get dropped while at a dead standstill by the carrier who continues to to focus us uh, whatever he's given us a medal at this point so could be worse naturally we are spotted again Plymouth is also spotted 12 inch guns can punch the Plymouth tactic angel thinks you do have to hit the darn thing, though. And now I'm stuck with sort of the contemplation of whether or not it would make more sense to shoot at that guy again or just get behind the cover of this island. I do not want to get torpedoed, obviously, because I do not have very good torpedo protection. Also, I guess they're just not much fun in general. 
considering that backing up would probably been a a bad decision um, I go ahead and throw on the throttle so we're gonna sail carefully around this it does look like a couple of ships pop up we're gonna have to take the shot of opportunity against Plymouth you can see the dispersion's not super great particularly if you're not doing anything to really help it But if you're playing this ship for the main battery potential, you're probably going to be a bit disappointed. The low damage is one thing. Uh, 1.8 Sigma is another. But we're trying to uh, make sure we get around this corner as we put our shells out on Plymouth. You can see we're, we are getting pens. Uh, if I was using the shell follow view there, we could probably see exactly where we were hitting. But our team continues to struggle in terms of how it's holding up to the enemy. Chapayev is turning out to us. We're going to try to exploit its positioning. Not, not very good. That was actually a, a relatively well-contained salvo. Uh, the beeping is telling me I'm going to hit an island, so we'll go ahead and take what shells we can get. Put them out there on Chapayev. We get even less. I think our Chapayev is going to have to do most of the damage against this, but I will do my best to help. So what I'm thinking at this point is... I might be able to get the Plymouth out. If I can get the Plymouth out, maybe I can get B. But it looks like somebody's jumped into A. I have been sort of biding my time, in part because I've been focused by the aircraft carrier to a, a considerable degree. And started out on the weak side. I'm not super fast, so I can't make a lot of plays really happen without just totally abandoning my flank. But I'll go ahead and sail into B. You can see our sonar gives us a couple extra seconds to dodge that. So slamming on the brakes. We make a turn and manage not to lose any more hit points off of that. Torpedoes dead ahead. This is probably a mistake. Accelerating to full speed. It looks like we're good. We've uh, we've dodged those. Thanks to just just the gap in our uh, already having nosed in. In order to go towards A. I actually think I'm going to miss even capping this. But I think if I had kept my foot on the brakes. I might have actually gotten gotten B here. So we'll just call that one a mistake as well. I would really love to be able to get a shot over my shoulder. To maybe contribute to what the team on the other side of the map is doing. I mean, it's my team, but it's on the other side of the map. You know what I mean. I just want to shoot one of those ships. We are getting shot, I believe, by the Iowa. Which is a bit concerning because... At this range, kind of anything can happen with that 32 millimeter deck. He is at a range where I imagine he can probably punch the ship. And I'm looking for the carrier, obviously. It looks like he had turned out, but then turned back in. We managed to dodge the torpedoes in front of us, but 
we have put ourselves in the path of what appears to be another torpedo. You can see for a moment there the sort of angles we could have had if maybe we had decided to take just an ordinary torpedo rather than an entire aircraft carrier, but in addition to the clear skies, he gives us the high caliber. Gets a little bit of vengeance for me dodging a lot, I guess. And honestly, that's the right decision for him because he was pretty much toast one way or the other. So I think he took command of that ship and drove it into me. That's the right decision. Remember, it takes two to ram. Anyway, this is going to end up closing out with the Iowa eventually getting whittled down and not enough time on the clock to finish off the last enemy destroyer. So, closing thoughts on Carl the 14th Johan. Sadly, this is another ship in a parade of lackluster campaign ships. This ship would have been more interesting if it was closer to its PC version. I don't know if you could tell that was my opinion the whole time, though I'm not suggesting a direct copy paste. I get why they don't particularly care for stealth torpedoes on a battleship, though don't ask me why that's not only possible, but almost guaranteed on a thing like Awami. Basically, they took away the one thing that really made this ship special and interesting and didn't give it anything in return. It'd be like porting over Babe Ruth from World of Baseball to World of Baseball Legends and then taking away his ability to hit the ball. He might still be usable, but you kinda took away the thing that kind of made him a standout baseball player. I mean, has anybody ever seen a picture of Babe Ruth where he isn't holding a bat? I realize this analogy kind of falls apart for those of you who know that Babe Ruth played both outfield and was a pitcher, which is kind of unheard of today, but all analogies fall apart somewhere. And I figure for half of my audience, baseball is that game where Americans stand around and watch a guy try to hit a ball with a stick, and if he does a good job, he gets to run in a circle. It's more complicated than that, but I get it at face value. You get my point, but what I'm trying to say is, if you take away what this ship is good at, what you're left with is a German battleship with inferior secondaries, different torpedoes, and more forgiving bow armor with relatively few choices. I wouldn't be all that surprised if Carl got some gentle buffs in the future, because holy jeez is this thing not fun to lose four kilometers worth of spotting advantage versus Yamato's in, but in any case, those are my thoughts on Carl. Let me know what you think down below, and as always, I hope to see you on the next one.